think one of the biggest learning experiences uh, in my little over year and a half here has been writing a sermon every week. And, and that's not hard. I love to, to, to do it. I love to write. I love um, to study and all that stuff. But, but the learning experience has been to study and prepare and put it together without feeling like I have to be on my knees confessing sin for what I've been studying 24 hours a day during the week. Uh, it's, it's very convicting to do that because you're studying at a, you know, I have my personal study time, but you're studying at a different level and, and, uh, and it makes you begin to, to think differently and, and, and struggle. And I know many pastor friends that are just like me that there's times that we're preaching on a subject that it's very uncomfortable for us to preach on because we know we stink at it at what we're telling you to do, we're not good at it at all. And, uh, um, and today, uh, retaliation is uh, something that many of us struggle with, and at times in my life, I have struggled with. Someone does me wrong, I'm going to do them wrong. And, uh, uh, and I remember several times in my life, and, and uh, uh, you hear, or I heard a lot growing up, that someone was so mad they saw red. Has anybody ever experienced that phenomenon? It is a real phenomenon that I did not know until I saw red. And I was so mad because uh, one of the times happened in, in my dorm room my freshman year of college, and, and this, this guy that lived on my floor had done something so wrong to me. Like, what I, what I had done was wrong, but he told someone else what I had done that hurt them. And I was so mad at him and wanted to retaliate him. And I, I've, I can honestly say I've never been in a fist fight. Just never have. Um, I've been in baseball fights, but those are just hug fests rather than actual throwing punches. Um, but, um, but that day I saw Red and I was like, he's going to get what he deserves. And I'm going to go and I'm going to pound on him like no one ever because I'm going to retaliate, and if I can't get at him, I'm going to figure out a way to hurt him somewhere else in his life. And I had a, a buddy on my, my floor that literally grabbed me and pushed me up against the wall and held me there until the red subsided out of my eyes. And then him and I went and sat and talked, and he walked me through it and was like, that's, that's not what you're supposed to do. That's not what God is calling you to do, and I'm thankful for that. Um, because I would have lost that fight um, in more ways than one. Um, but it was, it was so great to have that influence in my life to pull me aside and say no. And that's what Jesus has been doing all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, is bringing things to our attention that the human side of us says do, and Jesus says no, there's a better way. There's something better for us today, something better for you to do. And in Matthew chapter 5, he continues, and he starts off with, we all know this, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And, and that's, for me in my life, that was said all, you know, you hear that saying everywhere you go, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a uh, hand for a hand. Um, if if in, in certain countries, if you, do, if you steal, they're going to cut off your hand. Um, Jesus even says earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, if you lust, cut out your eye. And so an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But do we really know where that has come from? Because Jesus is really good at saying, it, you've heard it said or it's been said. And he says in Matthew 5, 38, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And basically, this was a specific law in the Old Testament. And laws have great things, great meaning, and great intent. But we have to be careful um, when our laws go the wrong way. Sandra Day O'Connor says this, Apparently, a great many people have forgotten that the framers of our Constitution went to such great effort to create an independent judicial branch that would not be subject to retaliation by either the executive branch or the legislative branch, because of some decision made by those judges. 
Well, that's important for today, I think, um, in our world today. But that's also important for our lives because the first thing we want to do when something doesn't go our way or something is offended to us or something um, uh, is hurtful for to us, the human nature is for us to retaliate. And Jesus knew this. God knew this way back when that this was going to be an issue. And so in, in the Torah, he puts in a specific law called the lex talionis. The lex talionis, the law of retaliation. And this is what it says in Deuteronomy 19.21. It says, your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. This is what happens if someone does something to you, the law would allow you to do the same. You could retaliate. The thing was, the original purpose, the original intent of this was to restrict people from doing more than appropriate retaliation. To restrict them rather than bring about revenge. Because if you've ever been in a really good, really great prank war, that like what happened when I was a senior in high school at church camp and we got into a prank war with another cabin and we had really good prank and they had a really good prank and then this and it just kept escalating and then somebody did what? They crossed the line. And they just, it just built and built and built and built. And so the law of Lex Talion, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't say that. The law of Lex Talionis was to prevent someone from crossing the line. So if someone stole from you, then this law would say you could steal the same amount back, basically. That's, that's a very broad thing. But it was put into place so that the punishment was appropriate. In fact, in Leviticus 19, or Levit Leviticus 24, he goes a little bit further in verse 19. says, if anyone injures his neighbor as he has it, as he has done it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good, and whoever kills a person shall be put to death. You shall have the same rule for the sojourner and for the native, for I am the Lord your God. So Moses spoke to the people of Israel, and they brought out of the camp the one who had cursed and stoned him with stones. Thus the people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. God is saying the punishment has to fit the crime. And one of the reasons he did this was so that you didn't take the law into your own hands and you didn't exact revenge versus retaliation. God says, don't take the law into your own hands. I've got it covered. This is the way it's supposed to be done. The punishment needs to match the crime. And what this, what this helped do was it helped make sure that in a court of law with a criminal that a magistrate did not give out unnecessary punishment. So in our laws today, if someone commits uh, manslaughter, there are certain limitations on what the sentence can be, depending on where you live. If you get a Class C misdemeanor, it's not even close to comparison to a third-degree felony. And so... This law was to protect people from not committing a Class C misdemeanor and being sentenced to a third-degree felony punishment. So God put this into place as a way for order to happen in society. And this punishment needed to match the crime because it was directly related to the section that we looked at last week. It is directly related to oaths. Because people would make oaths, remember we talked about that, they would swear to them that they would do this and that then they would have a debt with that. And it was so that those people would not come back harsher than they actually should if someone broke the oath. God is laying this out to them. And, 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 and if you look throughout the Torah, you see that this section immediately follows or immediately precedes sections talking on the oaths, which is why it's important here in the Sermon on the Mount that this immediately follows. But what's happening here is Jesus, Jesus's ministry so often 
while bringing people to him, was also questioning and challenging the religiosity of the day, the legalism of the day. He was going up against the Pharisees who had twisted and perverted things, twisted and perverted the law so that it did not mean what the intent of the law was. And so what's happening now is there are two leaders of the great Sanhedrin. And the great Sanhedrin was the high council of the Jewish priests. And and you've got two men, Shammai and Hillel. And Hillel, he had a school, a rabbinical school that he taught future rabbis. And his take on the law was a more broad. It was not necessarily literal. It was look at the meaning, look at the context, look at what is the purpose behind it. Shammai... His school was, you take it word for word, letter for letter, very legalistic view. And so when Jesus is talking about this, he's going up against that teaching. He's going up against that influence in the culture. And so Jesus says in verse 38, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you, take your tunic. Let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Jesus says, don't do what everyone would do. Do something completely different. He's telling us the basic message of the law is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But but I'm changing it because it's a new day and I'm here. And I have the authority to change it. And he's saying... The proper way to respond is not eye for eye, tooth for tooth. It's turn the other cheek and do more than is demanded. Do something completely countercultural. Don't do what is expected. Because in common sense, if someone were to hurt you, hurt them back. But Jesus says in verse 38, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. When it talks about do not resist the one who is evil, he is not saying go chase after the enemy. He's saying the person that has caused you harm in this is the evil one. They're influenced by something else, something that is not holy and pleasing to me. But don't resist him. Engage him in a way that changes the situation. He's not saying let him walk all over you. But he's saying make a message. Make a stand and proclaim a message of I'm not going to do what you think I'm going to do. I'm going to do something completely unexpected. I'm going to turn the other cheek. I'm going to do more than what I'm supposed to. If someone sues me for my tunic, I'm going to give him more than what what he's asking for in my cloak. If someone forces me to go one mile with him, I'm going to go two. And what he's doing is he's foreshadowing what he's going to do. He's foreshadowing what his life is going to do for, for us. Because he's going to take on a punishment that we didn't deserve. And so Jesus is looking at the original law that says, do what they deserve. Return and retaliate, but don't bring on revenge. And Jesus is saying, let them do more. Don't don't even avenge it. Just go the extra mile in giving to them. Don't be ordinary because ordinary is doing what everybody else does. He's saying be extraordinary, extraordinary. Live a life that is completely different than what we're wanting. 
And so when people want us to retaliate or expect us to retaliate, we respond in humility and grace and sacrifice. Be sacrificial. Jesus sacrificed his life for us on the cross. And so for us to come and be sacrificial in this moment is super important. He gave his life. What are you willing to give? Someone sues you for your tunic. Give him your cloak. Give him above and beyond. Go the extra mile and be intentional about it. Because when you live a life that's counterculture and doesn't do what people expect, then you make a statement to the world that I live differently because of Jesus. Because only if you have Jesus can you live this way. And look at what verse 42 says. It says, "Be give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who for, would borrow from you. And this is taking care of people. But this is the thing that, we, that, that Jesus is saying here. Give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Go out of your way to help them. But as he continues through the Sermon on the Mountain throughout his whole ministry, his message is this. Don't give them what they want the most. Give them what they need the most. Jesus doesn't give us what we want the most. He gives us what we need the most. And so when someone comes and begs for to you, and someone comes and asks to borrow something from you, then we need to look and see what is the situation. Why have they hurt us? Why have they offended us? Why have they given us cause for retaliation? And a lot of times, think about this in your world and in your circle and the times that you've been hurt and offended. Oftentimes that hurt comes because the other person has hurt in their life. And in some weird, sick, twisted way that our minds work, sometimes we hurt people because we want them to hurt us back because that's all we've ever experienced is hurt. And in that moment, God, those people are not needing us to hurt them back. Those people are needing us to do exactly what Jesus says to do next. And that's love your enemies. Those people that are expecting you to retaliate so that then they can hurt you again and again and it becomes this ongoing back and forth, back and forth because that's the cycle that they've been caught up in need their world rocked because you're going to show them love more than anything. And I think it's so appropriate that as Jesus is ending this section of the, the, the sermon, the very first part of the Sermon on the Mount, the first third that focuses on your character and your, the way you live your life from the inside out, he ends it by saying, love your enemies. People have hurt you. People have caused you harm. People have done this to you, and it's would be perfectly in your right to do the same to them. But I'm telling you above all, love them. Because that's what they need the most. They don't need your retaliation. They need your love. Look at what he says in verse 43. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be the sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. 
if there was a, ever a passage on equality among everyone, it's this. God brings the same reign on the just and the unjust. The sun rises and sets on both evil and good. We all live in the same world. And if Jesus Christ has poured his love out on you, then you as a follower of Christ should pour your love out on everyone, regardless of their belief system, regardless of the way they look, and regardless of your relationship with them. The law says, love your neighbor, hate your enemies, but Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And having lived in Mason for a year and a half now, I'm gonna be very blunt with who your enemy is as a community. It's one side of the political aisle. And how many of you pray for them on a daily basis? We might have personal enemies, but as a whole, we all have one side that we all want to be against. And Jesus is saying, the sun rises and sets on both of you. So love them. Love them. Love your enemies. Take it to another step because this is completely different than what the world thinks is going to happen. And I'm going to tell you this, and we're going to get to this point in just a second. Jesus is setting something up here. He's being very intentional in his words and his phrasing and what he's talking about because he's setting something up that they do not see coming. The whole point of this first section of the Sermon on the Mount that ends in don't retaliate the way you're supposed to, but go the extra mile um, in what they're doing and then to love them above all else, love those that want to hurt you, love those that don't like you, love those that want to bring harm to you. And in my experience in life, I've had enemies in work relationships, I've had enemies in personal relationships, and unfortunately, I've had enemies in the church. And some of those people have been the worst enemies I've ever faced which makes it very hard to love them, right? Because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ and they're purposefully bringing harm to me. Jesus says, look what you've done to me. You guys are going to take me to the cross, but I love you more than anything. And so this whole first thing to clean us out, to get us Moving to get us looking at our character and our internal perspective is to find out what does God really want for us. Eddie preached a sermon a couple weeks ago that he asked the question, what are we doing here? Why are we here? And I asked you the question, what does God really want for you? And I've talked to many people um, my age, friends, family, relatives, acquaintances that we are entering into this really great phase of life called midlife, usually followed with the word crisis. And all a midlife crisis is, is we don't know our purpose. And I was having a conversation the other day about our kids growing up and how quick in the blink of an eye they're gone. And the struggle with empty nesters is you really don't know your purpose at that point. Because for at least 18 years, your purpose had been raising your kid. And Jesus is saying, get all this ready because I'm going to tell you what God really wants for you. What your purpose is. What your purpose and what your identity in life is. And it's this. It's to go higher in character and imitate me. Jesus says, I'm going to go to the cross and every person that strikes me with a whip, with thorns and glass and metal and bone fragments ripping my flesh, I'm going to love them. 
Every person that spits on me or throws dirt on me or trash. Every person that talks negatively about me and breaks me with their words, I'm going to love them. I'm going to exude what Galatians 5, and 23 says, and I want you to do the same. I want you to be the fruit of the Spirit, full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Because against these things, there is no law. Jesus talks about what the law says all throughout the first part of the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said, but what I'm telling you is there's a higher life, a higher way of living. We're moving from the, the, the ground floor to the penthouse, and we've got to live accordingly to do that. Jesus is telling us that we're called to abandon the world's approach to life. We aren't to follow what they do. We're to live counterculturally. We are to have a different lens on the way the world works. And we are to navigate as aliens in a foreign land. Living differently. Living higher. Imitating Jesus in our life. And this is where it gets hard. Because the standards that Jesus tells us right here are impossible for us to live up to. Right? Look at what verse 48 says. You, therefore, must be perfect. Whoa. I thought there was only one perfect person because if there's, only, if there's more than one perfect person, the gospel doesn't work anymore, right? What do we do? Jesus is saying, you there must must be, therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And this is where Jesus is setting them up. Because I have no doubt in that crowd of disciples that were listening to Jesus that day, they're like, hold up. I've never been able to live according to the law perfectly. And now he's asking me to go an extra step? I can't do that. There's no way. But we have a misconception of what perfect means. Yes, Jesus lived a perfect life, but Jesus' life was sinless and blameless, and you and I cannot live up to that standard. But the perfect we can live up to is the maturity of our character to the point that we imitate Christ. Because perfect is maturity of character. You know, I like sports. And I like a particular university that's about four and a half hours away to the northwest, a place called Lubbock. And they've got a really good basketball team that works really hard. They have a lot of turnover because college sports has a lot of turnover now. But this year they got a particular uh, recruit to transfer in. And uh, uh, the thing that I love about this recruit, I've never watched, I think I've watched him play a game because he played for some other schools. Um, but I don't know much about it other than every day on his Twitter account, he posts 1% better every day. 1% better every day. If I get 1% better today, and then 1% better than that tomorrow, and 1% better than that the next day, guess what? I'm getting better every day. If I can get 1% more mature in my character today and 1% more mature in my character tomorrow and the, the next day and the day after that and the day after that, guess what? My character is growing. And I'm growing more like Christ every day. And that's what being a disciple of Christ is. is to grow more like him every day. And this is where Jesus changes everything. Because Jesus tells them the impossible. You have to do this. I want you to live up to this standard. Be perfect. And they're like, I can't do that. But what Jesus is saying, Jamie, you just. <laughs> Jamie told me, I'm going to pause for a second. Sidebar, I'm sorry. And I know you're hungry. Jamie, told, Jamie Henders told me a while ago that every time the roof cracked, her grandmother would tell her growing up that that was the spirit of the Lord in this room. And 
It's cracking. <laughs> I'm scared. Um, Jesus is telling them, I want you to live this way, but I know it's going to be tough. I know you can't attain it, but guess what? The kingdom is at hand. The one who's going to change everything is talking to you right now. And I'm telling you, you'll be able to achieve this through me. And he's saying, put your life in my hands. Give everything to me. I told you some really tough stuff. But if you follow me, as he talks about later in the sermon and in his ministry, I'll take care of it all. When he talks about retaliation, our preference would be to exact revenge on someone. And Jesus says, I don't want your preference. I want you to be in my presence. And when you're in my presence, I will get you through this and build your character. Jesus is leading up to the greatest event in history, his death, burial, and resurrection. And if you look at this and say, I'm a believer and there's no way I can do that, Jesus says, there's only one way you can do that. And that's in me. And so that leads to some hard conversations for ourselves of how truly committed as a follower of Christ am I? Am I willing to love my enemies just as Jesus has loved me? Because when we sin, we become an enemy of Christ. But we have received grace. And are you willing to extend grace to those that don't deserve it? How serious are you about your walk with Christ? Are you willing to give him everything that he's talked about in this first chapter of Matthew chapter 5? Are you willing to give all that to him and live a life so that he can say, I told you to be perfect just as the Holy or Heavenly Father is perfect. And guess what? Your character matured to where we can say, yes, you live the life that followed me. You live the life that was pleasing to me. And because you lived your life that way, my name was made known. When we ask the question, what are we doing here as a church? Why do we do what we do? To bring glory and honor to God's name and to point people towards him. And when we live our lives like this, when someone so blatantly hurts us, it's obvious they're an enemy of us and we show love to them, what does that show to the world? There's only one way to live this way. That's the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know that many of you in here have professed that before and, and, and truly have a relationship with him. Some of us have said that and never really meant it. And others are like, what are you talking about? And I just want to stop and I just want to say it's very simple. God loved the world so much that he sent his son, his one and only son, to live a life fully God and fully man, just like us living on earth, except for one thing, he never sinned. He never disobeyed the father. He lived a perfect, blameless, sinless life. Because we had to have a substitution because our sin, our sin nature that causes us to do things that are dishonoring and displeasing to God is so strong that our punishment should be death. The punishment should match the crime. And Jesus came and he's like, I got you covered. I'm going to live this sinless, blameless life so that I can take on a punishment that doesn't match the crime so that you can find freedom in me. Amen. So he took that and he went and carried that sin to the cross with him, was beaten, broken, tortured, and crucified. Dead. 
Not nearly dead, as Billy Crystal said in a famous movie, but dead. Dead, dead. For three days. And then the stone was rolled away. And Jesus was alive. And in that, death was defeated so that you might have eternity with him. That's the gospel right there. The life-saving message of Jesus Christ right there. And if you've never heard that or if you've heard it a million times and have never said, I believe, today's the day. 